Hello everyone, I'm Rupa from Cumulus Networks and uh, for those of you who don't know what Cumulus is, Cumulus is a derivative of Debian uh, for network switches. Um, and I, uh, I belong to the engineering team in Cumulus. I work on the kernel and other networking uh, packages in user space. Um, happy to be here, happy to be seeing a Canadian summer actually. I've been here multiple times, uh, numerous conferences and it's all been in winter. So, okay, uh, to set the tone of the talk, um, I wanted to uh, just give a high level overview. So this talk is about open, net open networking revolution that happened um, or is still happening in about six years, around six years now, and how Debian has been at the center of this revolution. Thinking of Debian just not as a server OS, but also a network OS. There are a bunch of changes in between the two operational models, but um, fundamentally, we have uh, tried to bring Linux to the networking world and shown that uh, you can uh, run a server OS on a networking box. And it's about a journey of uh, building a network oper operating system with Debian, and also how uh, extending Linux hardware acceleration model to network switches. Okay, um, I'm not sure how many people uh, are uh, know or know about open networking, so I just put this slide up to uh, give some context. So this is a sample modern day data center network topology. It's called a class topology. Basically, you have racks of servers and then the tar switches, and uh, on top of that, the spine switches. And there's many more things around it, uh, but. So when I talk about closed network devices, I'm talking about the TORs and the spine switches. So these have been uh, always been the Cisco's and Arista's closed box uh, switches and routers which can uh, do terabits uh, of packets, which can switch packets in hardware. These have specialized switch ASICs which uh, are capable of doing this. And the server racks, as you know, they run uh, Debian and any other Linux distribution. So this talk is about Debian moving up the rack, uh, basically running Debian not only on your servers, but also on your TOR switches and spine. So all this started with the open networking movement and Cumulus uh, Networks was uh, very much a part of it and kind of started it. Uh, basically networking boxes with these uh, high-end chips were mainly closed boxes with the CLI and nobody could access anything other than the CLI. You program the network uh, using the CLI. So the open networking revolution actually brought disaggregation, uh, just like the, what happened to server world, uh, basically uh, separating the hardware with the OS, and then you have an open box where you can run networking apps on. So basically bringing the Linux ecosystem to networking. It was about uh, leveraging lessons from the server world, open bootloaders, getting uh, more platforms adopted in an easier way, um, open Linux ecosystem and Linux API, which would um, help your apps move um, to different Linux uh, devices. So in the open networking la landscape today, the NOS architectures, there are two types of NOS architectures. Again, this is, uh, the slide is again laying context for what I'm going to talk next. So with the open software model, disaggregated model, you have two types of uh, architectures. One where it, uh, like what Cumulus does, basically uh, use nati native Linux kernel and uh, accelerate that to hardware. For example, you, uh, you program routes in the Linux kernel like you do on a normal Linux box or a server, and that you, uh, there's a driver which offloads that to hardware, switch ASICs. And there is another um, architecture which is actually run by most of the other vendors who are now pressurized to join the open networking movement to not lose control over their software or over their SDK, to keep some control over the closed uh, parts of, of their SDK. And this other architecture actually um, provides a hardware offload API, which apps can, networking app, apps can write to. So there's pros and cons to both uh, architectures. Uh, well, the native Linux uh, architecture actually wins overall. 
you basically your uh, applications written to a Linux API, like for example Quagga or um, or LLDPD for that matter, which is using the Linux native Linux uh, API or uh, API to program network interfaces, can work on a server or any other uh, networking box. On the other hand, the closed or the um, software stack that is being pushed by other vendors is basically using hardware offload API, uh, apps directly write to it, and that makes your networking app non-portable and you will have to uh, rewrite the app to other uh, network chips and hardware. So advantages of using the Linux networking API is basically as shown in the picture. Um, you basically run your same applications, your Quagga routing su suite or your LLDPD or DHCPD. The same application runs on, um, yeah, on your server or your switches or any other network device. With this, you're actually bringing the server and the networking communities together as well. Uh, uniform net Linux networking models. You don't want to create a bond or a bridge in a different way on a server and a different way on a Tor. This unifies uh, all networking. It minimizes operational problems. You can use your same monitoring and debugging tools everywhere to monitor your servers and your uh, TORs and other network devices. And package management. Package management, as we all know, it's not a simple problem. Um, yeah, in this picture, we show servers, and all these use the same code base and the same package management, and it's Debian everywhere. So now, uh, the next few slides are, I don't dive deep into um, a lot of things, but it's a high level, um, uh, high level rundown of all the packages and all the uh, features that we touched for Debian and uh, to make it a successful network operating system. So why Debian? Um, as some of us, there are other Cumulus folks here, this started with uh, ODM PowerPC switches from Taiwan. And uh, yeah, there were PowerPC, and Debian was the only architecture at that point, uh, or only distribution that supported PowerPC at that point. And Debian has the largest ecosystem of networking applications. Um, you can actually search for any networking protocol or ne any networking package, and it, it is there. And it has a growing and strong community. Then came the need for a open networking NOS installer to standardize uh, NOS loading across uh, open hardware. And this was critical because if you don't get this in, and um, there, there will be a lag in movement. So this is another project that Cumulus worked on. It's called ONI. It's the open networking install environment, which is today almost a de facto standard for open networking boxes. It is, um, it is open, it is an open compute foundation, and uh, yeah, these, now most of these uh, op open networking boxes from, uh, or disaggregated boxes from Taiwan, Taiwan or any of the ODMs, they come prepackaged with ONI, which gives them a choice to um, run any network operating system. Kernel and platform bring up. Again, these were closed boxes, no hardware specs, very difficult uh, to uh, port Linux to these in an open way, like any other, uh, like pick up Debian and port to it. So, and so it was not, I've not personally worked on a platform bring up, but there are many people who uh, have in the company have worked on this. And yeah, it was a laborious process, getting specs, reverse engineering, and so on. So there is, this is, a, this says that this industry needs a lot of uh, standardization in this area, about hardware standardization to get platforms integrated quicker and early. And there is an effort going on, which is to extend ACPI uh, for network hardware. And this is, again, uh, bringing, leveraging whatever was done for the server world to the open networking um, industry. So there is a spec, uh, there's a link to a spec describing this. Netlink, uh, I had to add the slide on this because, so Netlink is the protocol that we know, which is a protocol between kernel and user space, and it's kind of becoming the de facto uh, network configuration API for Linux. Every new kernel API that you add for Linux networking has, is Netlink. 
So, and we have reused Netlink to a great extent. We, it, for us, it's also an offload API, uh, basically offload Linux uh, networking to our switch ASICs. It's uh, configuration monitoring. It's also become a very um, powerful tool or powerful API to add monitoring capabilities to, uh, to Debian or Linux in general, and for ne network troubleshooting as well. So in the course, we did enhance, we had to enhance a lot of uh, Netlink libraries for, say, scale, like LibNL. And we, di we did take these packages from uh, Debian, and we had to enhance them for scale. And we also had to, uh, we actually ended up writing another Python Netlink manager um, or library. So networking bring up. Um, so uh, since we have modeled a switch uh, ASIC as a Linux server or, um, a Linux op or any general Linux operating system, we represent every switch port as a network device. And so now your switch looks like a Debian server with 128 NIC ports, 128 or more NIC ports. And these NIC ports are now 100 gig, 40 gig, or whatever uh, these high-end switches are capable of. So there are many fe switch features that have been um, deployed by other vendors, like port ganging, splitting ports, and so on. All these became necessary when we brought uh, necessary elements to Linux when we got this uh, um, to on the open hardware. So the challenges here were again scale. Uh, when you would, when we started picking up packages from Debian and started running on these, now you have 120 NIC ports and LLDPD on servers runs on two or three NIC ports, uh, ETH0, ETH1. So some of these challenges with scale, we fixed uh, LLDPD and many other packages, LibNL, DHCPD, move them to Netlink or upgrade them to latest uh, packages where they were, they were already fixed. L1 config, um, yeah, there's lots of SFPs. I'm not an expert in SFPs, but there's a lot of SF, lots of SFPs and lots of uh, other parameters for link settings, 100 gig, 40 gig, FEC settings, and so on. So that, that also is critical for a NAS. And tons of net, networking attributes on switch ports uh, for bridging, for STP, lots of timers. Uh, tuning of timers and so on, a lot of uh, networking attributes that need to be uh, added. Now, this, uh, offloading all this to the switch ASIC, most of these vendors still have proprietary SDKs, um, which mostly run in user space. So we had to map uh, the Linux API to the SDK API. And for example, a bridge FTP add, which adds a forwarding entry into a bridge, had to be yeah, mapped to an SDK API which programmed the hardware. So user basically sees the Linux API. Um, you do everything what you did on a server exactly on a network hardware, and we seamlessly offload the networking functions to hardware. Switch chip initialization. This is something different, and uh, it's required in some of these uh, vendor SDKs or APIs are proprietary and closed. So we have uh, written a bunch of tools and uh, scripts and so on to do it in a Linux way, a file-based config file. And this is, this is also being worked upstream to um, include this natively in the Linux kernel in the SwitchDev project. And the SwitchDev project is basically natively in the kernel handlers for offloading to hardware. So, yeah, this API is called DevLink. Um, it's again a Netlink gen generic Netlink API. It's available in uh, latest IP route two versions. Tunables, network parameters. So on a server, uh, many of these parameters are default to the Linux defaults. Now on a switch, it's very critical to change these, some of these defaults because, yeah, because switch is forwarding uh, and also something like Ignore routes with link down. This is, uh, yeah, this is critical. Basically, Linux by default does not uh, forwards or routes through uh, ports with link down. And so this is something that we got in the kernel 
to, uh, because it was critical, you cannot, um, you have to ignore routes with link down uh, interfaces. Networking demons, like I said, Debian has, Debian uh, ecosystem repos has network, all sorts of network. There's, there's a ton more I've not added here, like PTP and so on. Um, so yes, the initial days was uh, of porting Debian to a, not, a networking hardware was getting all these demons, testing them for interface scale mainly, and interop. And most challenges that we faced were on scale. Because uh, it's not only the number of physical ports, but now when you do bridging and VLAN in a nat Linux native way, you end up creating network interfaces uh, on the ports. So we could easily scale to hundreds and thousands of network interfaces. Network interface configuration. I've talked about this uh, in DevConf before, and it's a hard problem. It's, again, the sheer scale. Um, and a scale of not only the number of net devs, but it's also the number of networking attributes that you have to now configure on each port. Uh, STP parameters and STP, there are tons of STP parameters. I, uh, yeah, I don't even know half of them, but uh, so, and in the same time, you have to handle differences between servers and switches. So the pressures here, pressure or challenges here that we faced were basically from the users. Of course, we are now uh, trying to sell this to people who have used closed boxes with CLIs, selling them a config file and telling them to configure thousands of interfaces or interface attributes in a flat file. Yeah, that did not go that well. So um, yeah, and people do, there is a lot of people who love Linux and the, um, the files and config files and all that, but an automation, but there's also a group of people who do not want to move from their CLI. So yes, uh, we ended up doing two things. One is rewriting IFUP down to IFUP down two, just for scale dependency tracking, because people didn't want to do dependency, interface dependency on their own. So IFUP down two, it's in Debian now. Uh, and we, there are a t um, many differences between how you set CCTLs on uh, Debian and uh, the default CCTLs on Debian and servers. So what we have done is we have uh, controlled these differences via policy files. So a user can drop in a policy to change the defaults, and that's what Cumulus does. We have a bunch of Cumulus uh, default policy files to tailor to a network operating system. And yes, there was a very uh, great need of a CLI or many people wanting a CLI or people not wanting to change SNMPD config in a file or an LLDPD and interfaces on another file. So yes, we now have actually a unified Linux file editor uh, and manager, which basically translates edits files and up appends to files and so on. Kernel networking. Um, so we exercise a lot of uh, kernel network features, bridging, routing, routing to a great extent, ACLs, um, and networking tools, IP route to bridge utils, ETH tool. So we end up backporting a lot of latest. Uh, we started from Debian, and some of these we have moved to the latest upstream versions, or some of them we have kept the Debian version, but we backport a lot of patches from upstream. We do work closely with Upstream, uh, the Linux kernel community, to add many of these uh, enhancements to Linux. So talking about Linux networking features, um, some of these uh, are important to a NOS, and I've listed them here to, uh, yeah, to complete the picture on what it takes to build a NOS. Uh, WERF. WERF is a virtual routing and forwarding instance. It's like a VLAN for L3 or for your IP addresses isolation. It provides IP addresses isolation. It's a very important feature in a network operating system. For example, um, there is something called management WERF, which is a default feature in a network operating system, isolating your E0 port from your uh, switch ports. So E0 carries all uh, management traffic, and the IP address and everything, the L3 uh, uh, context is completely isolated from your switch port um, traffic. 
And so Linux kernel now has the WERF uh, uh, feature. And the newer kernels, the newer Debian uh, releases already have it. I have done too has support for provisioning WERF, also provisioning management WERF. And we have, by our defaults, the NOS defaults we manage by I have done to policy files. Then MPLS. MPLS is another uh, protocol, label switching uh, protocol needed uh, sometimes in the data center or other, uh, other environments. So we have um, enhanced the kernel data path, MPLS data path, and I have done to also has support to configure it or to enable it per port. Then some of the other features I've just listed is QNQ, multicast routing, and lightweight tunnels. Lightweight tunnels is again a way to, configuring, to configure your um, network tunnel interfaces by not creating a net device. Again, this was done to solve the um, net dev scale problem because uh, on a NOS, yeah, creating 1,000 tunnel endpoints, VXLAN tunnel endpoints, you end up creating 1,000 VXLAN devices and that uh, won't scale. So with this LWT, you can move to a single VXLAN device. MPLS tunnels are no more a device. So this is something that is catching on. Uh, there are many tunnel uh, net devices that are being eliminated or moved to a single device, or you don't need a network interface at all. Routing. Routing, we started with the Quagga package from Debian, and we had a lot of enhancements. We have contributed uh, to the Quagga community. And now there is a fork of Quagga, which is called FRR, which hopefully will be <laughs> in Debian also. Overlays. Overlays is another uh, net NOS feature, uh, VXLAN tunnel endpoints. So overlays is a good example, or um, the Linux model of deploying overlays is a uh, it's a good example to prove the Linux native hardware acceleration model that I was talking about earlier. You can do VXLAN overlays the same way that you did on servers or hypervisors, the exact same way you do it on a switch, and you get the benefit of hardware accelerating um, it with the switch ASIC. Monitoring. Monitoring applications, again, NetSNMP, SFlow, and I'm pretty sure there are uh, many others. We have picked up many of these from Debian as well. Um, again, I mean, everything worked right off the box. Just the issues that we have had is with scale and number of interfaces, which we have fixed. Or in some cases in NetSNMP, I think the latest version in Debian moved to Netlink, and that uh, helped a lot. SFlow is another uh, sampling protocol. It's uh, yeah, now we have an upstream Linux API to actually do SFlow on using TC on the servers and uh, which can be offloaded seamlessly on a network switch. Systemd, uh, we do use Systemd for most of our monitoring of our network services. Systemd WERF enhancements is a recent addition. These are not upstream yet, but at some point we do want to get some of our WERF uh, packages into Debian. So the WERF is an isolation, L3 isolation for a, you can isolate a process into a particular L3 context. So for example, you can run multiple instances, each having their own isolated uh, L3 context. And systemd unit files kind of uh, helped here, helped here uh, a bit. The WERF uses uh, C groups, C groups to attach a particular L3 uh, process in a put uh, L3 process in an, sorry, put a service in an L3 context, and we use the systemd uh, C group mechanism to actually do this. Futures, um, we do want to push some of these enhancements. Some are, some are already upstream. Some are, uh, the latest version of Debian has already picked them up. And um, yeah, new tools and managers that we have written to make things easier for deploying uh, in a NOS environment. We would like to push it to Debian at some point, slowly over the years. Yep, that's, that's all my talk.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Any questions? Hi. Uh, well, I'm a happy user of Community Linux for more than a year, so thank you for this product. I love it. Okay. Uh, I have a few questions regarding the relationship between Cumulus and Debian. Uh, for instance, uh, when, when you look at the uh, GitHub repository uh, of Cumulus uh, and you look at the issues and stuff, there are mentions of, okay, we will make a refresh from the master repo and or we plan to, but there, is, yes, there are usually no deadlines and I, I would like to have some clarification on, okay, how, how does that work? Do you have uh, a private repo? And then periodically, uh, when, is, when does that happen? Do you contribute your code so, to the open source? Yeah, so it depends on the project. So most of the projects we work directly with upstream, like for the kernel, we have everything going in the kernel directly, the upstream kernel, and then Debian picks it up. The one package that we are still uh, trying to move to an open development model is IFRBDAM2, which we, yeah. So yeah, that's just purely because of uh, no cycles right now, but that's the intention, and we want to move to an open development model. But uh, yeah, we don't mind pushing code every day there. It's just that it's easier for us to right now push into a release, and then when we have cycles, move. Uh, because one thing that we want to make sure is the lag is mainly because one thing we want to make sure that the changes we have done work on Debian. Or what we do is immediately when we know that it breaks, we have to add wrap into a policy file so that it's only invoked on a NOS. So it just requires some cycles, and that's why it's delayed. But we'll soon, we'll soon be having an open repo. I can elaborate slightly. <clears throat> Um, with if up down too, it is also in the released version that comes with every release is available as a Debian source package, so you can get the yeah. source that way as well. The definitely understand the point about wanting to have new features go into the public repo first, but you know that's that's a different thing. But all of the all of the source for the actual release is available. Okay, thanks. And uh, what what about uh, PTMD? I never saw any Debian package for that, and actually I wanted to use it for servers. Yeah, I I don't think there is a Debian package for that, but we will probably be putting it soon, yeah. Okay, and uh, well, one last question then. Uh, well, apart from, uh, you know, for instance, imagine I'm using AFAP down 2, but not on Cumulus switches, but uh, on my server and stuff. Where should I report bugs that I find? Where should I contribute uh, patches and stuff like that? Should I do that on GitHub? Uh, GitHub is better right now. GitHub or Debian, we, both, we monitor both places, so yeah. GitHub, you can send a pull model. Uh, you can use the pull uh, request to actually send us a patch, or okay. yeah, or just email us. So there is uh, we have Julian here and there who is monitoring the GitHub website and so far. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Can you speak a little about how uh, the Cumulus uh, kernel and ASIC drivers and other things uh, are structured, uh, packaged, and delivered? Uh, sure. So, I have the picture. So, the offload itself or just the distribution of the ASIC drivers? So, okay, so you support um, a lot of different hardware vendors' boxes, I guess, and uh, with a variety of ASICs. Mm -hmm. um, and are these uh, proprietary drivers and are you using your own kernel package, or are, you, um, are they structured as out of tree drivers? Or Yeah, so uh, the, our kernel contains a lot of GPL platform drivers, additional drivers that we sometimes we get from the vendor, and most of them are GPL, but they are not upstream, some of them. Some of them are upstream, so you'll find them in our kernel package. The, we do ship a user space um, offload driver that is offloads to hardware, and that interfaces with the vendor SDKs. In most cases, those are closed. Um, but yeah, soon we'll have, a, I guess, a switch dev implementation also, which will be based on a pure, completely open driver. Yeah, it depends on the vendor. And Mellanox right now is the one vendor which has an open source driver. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, 
uh, I was uh, a little bit late from your talk, sorry for that. So I may be totally mistaken, but uh, why didn't you mention Open V switch, the project, I mean? Open V switch? Yeah. Uh, why didn't I mention, so we, uh, as Open V switch to uh, offload flows, because we don't, uh, it's not in flow offload uh, hardware, I mean, we don't offload flows to hardware. No, it, uh, I mean the software project. It, it, it has a similar scope, at least uh, partly, with what you do. It, uh, it supports some uh, offload uh, switching engines and uh, ASICs probably. I, I'm, not, I'm no expert, uh, but uh, I find it surprising that uh, you do something very similar and uh, still I can't hear a single so word of mention. Okay, so we, um, so I know there are open V switch, um, there are distributions which offload open V switch directly to hardware. So what we have, we do have an implementation where we uh, take open V switch flows and they are translated into Linux um, forwarding elements, and then that gets offloaded to hardware. It's kind of the same thing, but if you want an OVS front end and you have a controller and so on, you can still use our our box to offload it to hardware. But our uh, def default model is runs with just Linux commands and the uh, Linux API and we offload to hardware. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, I did discover the product like a month ago. I was so happy to see that in the market, but I, I, I'm always curious about uh, how do you got success as a company? It means, because I know it's a lot of work, and there's, I think, a lot of developers that you pay for that work. So uh, my question is about the business model, uh, if you want to share it, because it's always like good to know how people can go inside the open source ecosystem, especially when you are going more in the hardware place that is hard hard is that just the software part? So the business business model is we do sell support. The We do sell, it's, it's like any other Linux distribution, like how Red Hat uh, is. We do uh, license support. And um, yeah, that's basically the business model. Yeah. So I'm um, asking a couple of questions from people watching on IRC. Um, first of all, question one, how far are you with the VOF? Can I run a routing protocol, for example, BGP? WRF and BGP, is yeah. that what the question is? Yeah, we do have uh, BGP support for WRF, and that should already be in the FRR uh, repo or the Quagga repo. Okay, cool. And the second one, could you provide any ideas on performance for top of whack as compared to, say, a current Cisco Nexus? No, I, I don't know, but I can get that information. I don't know on top of my head. Does anybody else? Yeah. You probably know Nolan. Yeah. Nolan is the founder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hi. Um, so the performance of like a Cisco Nexus, like a 3064, for example, will be strictly identical to any Cumulus platform that has the same forwarding ASIC in it, which in this case is a uh, Broadcom Trident. Plus? Yeah, Trident Plus. Trident Plus. And so, you know, all of the actual forwarding is being offloaded, is being run in the hardware. So the CPU is just running things like, you know, BGP and, and all the various protocols. And most of these things have, you know, fast multi core x86 chips in them. So, you know, there's plenty of extra CPU um, around and memory around if you want to run, you know, applications on it as well. So, you know, performance, they're, they're mostly idle usually. Uh, how logical are some of these pieces? Like you just mentioned that you have a Quagga branch or something like that. If, would it be possible to run uh, another uh, software like Bird as an alternate yeah. routing? Yeah, protocol? definitely. We have people doing that as well because it's an open box. You are, and because Bird talks uh, Linux to the kernel again, it uses the same API. So, so what are the? Why do you have a separate Quagga branch that you were talking uh, so the special FRR, about this? The Quagga FRR repo, um, yeah. the FRR project. The, uh, I, so the FRR project is, again, not a closed repo or a closed branch. It's, again, a community 
driven fork of Quagga because of various other reasons, uh, because patches were not going in as. Right. Uh, so, but it's not a closed thing. It's again a foundation which is built around FRR, and I think it's part of Linux Foundation now. Yeah. Okay. I, I misunderstood. I thought it was a, a cumulus specific no, no, branch no. of Quagga. Okay. No, it was again a community fork. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you.